everyone, this is Mrs. Ortega here. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so last video we were on invertebrates. Um, so that's where we will continue on this video in chapter 33 looking at different groups of vertebrates. And so we're going to start today with the annelids on slide number 48. Uh, the annelids are going to be um, kind of coelomates with bodies composed of fused rings. Uh, so fused rings is the key identifier here in that uh, the name annelid comes from, um, which means um, little rings is how it translates. Um, and so the animals in this group will have fused uh, ring seg body segments. And there are two major groups, the Arantia and Sedentaria. And so let's take a look at the Arantians in the next slide here. Uh, the Arantians are going to be mobile marine organisms, uh, no, most notably for their many um, little feet on the sides called parapodia which mean, um, translates to beside or next to and feet. Uh, so these feet are on each side of the body segment or, or on the ring. Um, and so each um, foot has numerous bristles named uh, ch chitty. Um, and these bristles are made out, uh, made out of the polysaccharide chitin, um, which we'll see, uh, which we saw I'm sorry, which we will see in the arthropods um, having um, their exoskeleton made out of this hard polysaccharide. Uh, so for this, you'll want to understand they're rantians, they're mobile, they're marine um, organisms. So these worms are going to be uh, going to be uh, marine worms, whereas here the sedentarians that come is made up of many. Um, many different organisms um, and so all of these are unified by um, the word sed sedent which means or translates from land to sit um, and so this is anything that's less mobile whereas rantians uh, their word translates to traveling uh, which is french i think uh, is tr translates to traveling uh, so these are the mobile versus not as mobile worms or annelids. And so that's the key, oops, sorry, uh, that's the key difference here. And so uh, for sedentarians, there are several species uh, you might be familiar with. Um, some of them are called tube worms. And so these are actually shown on the bottom here, the Christmas tree worm. Um, so what you're looking at in that picture are uh, some tentacles of, uh, of the worm, some projections um, used for feeding and gas exchange. And then their stalk um, is uh, actually an outer layer of calcium um, carbonate that the worm secretes for protection and support. And so inside of that hard layer um, is a worm itself. And then it has holes in this um, shell-like um, thing to bring out the tentacles. Another one here is a tube worm. As you can see, this tube worm uh, has a nice uh, light colored pink sh uh, shell that or um, protection layer that it secretes and then the the dark red uh, is a worm itself. And so that's actually a video I can play for you. Let's see. Oh, so it's a very short video, but as you can see, these are the um, True, I guess, sedentarians. There are also two other ones that are much, much different, and those are the leeches and the earthworms. And so the leeches here, uh, some of them uh, live in freshwater, some are marine, and some are terrestrial. So there's a wide range of um, environments that they live in. They um, will 
be uh, parasitic in nature, that they're going to suck blood of, of invertebrates. And so to do so, they will either have teeth or small jaws to cut open um, that host, and then they will um, start uh, bring, sucking on the blood. And so to keep that blood um, flowing, they're going to secrete a chemical called hyrudin, which is here. Um, this is what uh, prevents blood from coagulating or solidifying or clumping together. And so that's very important to keep uh, the uh, blood flow going for the leech. And so they can live up to months at a time um, after a feeding. Um, they are, have been used in the medical field um, up to the 20th century uh, for bloodletting. But now they're mostly used for very specific uh, swelling-related injuries um, where blood is uh, gathering and they want to get rid of that blood. And so um, other uses now are is this chemical hyrudin is actually being used to uh, prevent or uh, treat blood clots um, by breaking up uh, that blood. Um, it's going to hopefully save a lot of people. Okay, and now earthworms are also part of the sedentary group. Uh, they are known for eating through the soil. Uh, living underground, and as they uh, move throughout the soil, they're going to um, aerate it, so uh, leaving cavities of uh, openings for oxygen and other gases to be to maintain. And so they will extract nutrients from the soil as they eat their way through uh, through the underground. And so whenever they um, excrete their uh, waste. Uh, actually acts as fertilizer and so earthworms are actually very beneficial for um, plants as well as uh, anyone growing uh, crops and so um, having a lot of earthworms in the soil is actually very good and so that's something uh, just common um, idea about earthworms you want to understand um, trying to keep with letting you know ahead of time what to focus on here uh, for the leeches, before I forget, um, the leeches, this chemi this one here is probably the most important trait for leeches. Um, so then for earthworm reproduction, they are capable of both sexual and asexual reproduction. Uh, they are hermaphrodites, uh, but they don't uh, self-fertilize. They will cross-fertilize with another earthworm um, by uh, coming together in di different directions. They'll be able to swap sperm on that uh, ribbon-like region um, called the clitellum. And so from there, then they can fertilize their eggs and make more earthworm. Um, other, other ways for um, asexual reproduction would be from fragmentation, um, most likely due to an accident of a body part of the earthworm get segmented off, it can grow the rest back. And so here is, it should be a video of this earthworm displaying its versatile movement. They have two types of muscle um, that allow for it to move in different directions. And so both circular and longitudinal muscle allow for this worm to inch forward, as you see there. And the longitudinal muscle brings the um, into the posterior region um, back to the front, um, so moving it upwards. Uh, so those setae that you see there, those are bristles on the skin of the earthworm that allow for it to maneuver more better through the soil. All right, so looking at the earthworm diagram here, you might uh, see this in lab as earthworms are one of those eligible um, specimen for dissection. Uh, so I like to look at this a little bit more here that each ring is separated by uh, septum or septa, which is um, plural here. And that's... Nope. Try that again. There we go. 
um, septum. Those are uh, partitions between segments of the body. Um, and so inside that septum, they also have uh, for each region, blood vessels, the intestine, um, nerve cord, and um, the waste, uh, the, similar to our urinary, urinary waste, so be the uh, liquid waste, metanephrium, um, that are also there in green. Um, and so looking at the circulatory system, uh, the skin, or sorry, the earthworm will actually receive its gas exchange through its skin and primarily the dorsal side. And so uh, as that uh, occurs, um, it, will, um, it, it will make the carbon dioxide leave, the oxygen will diffuse in, and then from there it goes into the capillaries, which will then go to the main dorsal blood vessel. That will return it to the head or the anterior region, the earthworm, um, which is here. And so from there, it will get pumped through these um, structures that are similar to hearts that are called aortic arches. And so from these aortic arches, which they note here as circulatory system vessels, then it's going to go through, um, through the ventral vessel and go uh, spread those nutrients throughout the rest of the body and then it's going to circle back up at the um, end of the earthworm and go through the dorsal side spreading nutrients exchanging nutrients and then going back down and getting pumped through again um, so that's the circulatory system of the earthworm and so uh, looking at the hearts or pseudo hearts are not true hearts um, they're called aortic arches. Having trouble writing today. And so for the for the earthworm, eating is pretty simple. It pulls the, th the soil through the mouth, uh, where it will then go to the uh, through the esophagus. Um, temporarily to the crop where it momentarily stores the, the soil or their food. The gizzard there would be next, so it will grind up that soil into tiny little bits for the intestine then to um, absorb the nutrients, and then the waste will go out through the anus. So it's a complete digestive system. All right, uh, moving along to our... Um, Ectisocins. Uh, so this is the second group moving away from the lophotrophozoans to the echo uh, ectisocins. They have a tough coat called a cuticle that gets molted um, or shed through a process called ectisis. And so the two largest ones in this group are the nematodes and the arthropods. Uh, so nematodes are also known as roundworms. They're found in many different habitats, uh, in aquatic, in soil, in plants, um, in, or in um, tissues of animal. Uh, they will have a, um, a digestive system that's not complete, but so it's called an alimentary canal, but they'll lack a circulatory system, which is weird. Um, and that they will be able to exchange uh, those things um, <clears throat> um, uh, through their skin, I believe. And so the nematodes or roundworms are pictured there. And this one in particular is called Ascaris. <clears throat> it's also one that's eligible for lab for dissections. <clears throat> and so they are um, very similar, I guess, in size and shape to the earthworm, but they're much, much simpler than the earthworm in terms of structure and that they have, um, they don't have a complete digestive system where uh, they are going to be more parasitic in nature, usually uh, attaching to a host, absorbing their food, uh, swallowing that into their bodies, uh, absorbing the nutrients and then excreting any waste through the anus. And so it's not a complete digestive system uh, they are going to 
<clears throat> have a uh, what we call a fluid that bathes their organs called a sulu seal. Um, it's like a, it's a false cavity. It's not a true cavity like other animals. And what else? Let's see. And they're known for their cuticle, uh, which is part of the group as a whole. Um, this tough coat called a cuticle is actually going to be a um, corduroy type appearance, like soft and velvety on the outside of some nematodes, um, but it's not really shown in this image. <laughs> um, but that is the main, I believe, what on here. Uh, the main thing from the slide is this right here. Right. Um, so in terms of some examples of nematodes, one um, known for its research, its information found in research, uh, scientists use it all the time to study is C. elegans, or the long version is written right here. Um, this is actually one of the few non-parasitic nematodes. Um, so we happen to pick the one of the few that's actually not going to try to be a parasite to study and dissect. And we've learned tremendous things from the C. elegans, but um, unfortunately it's one of the few that's not parasitic. And the ones that are parasitic usually have a complex life cycle where their uh, larva will live um, inside an intermediate host before infecting the final host. And so uh, the one noted here is um, acquired by humans through undercooked pork in that the pigs will house the larva um, in, in their muscle tissue. And then from there, uh, if that undercooked pork um, gets eaten by humans, then it's going to, the larvas or, or juveniles are going to then go to uh, the digestive system of the, as it's going through the digestive system of the human, it's going to mature into the adult and um, inhabit uh, the intestines. And so that is one of the reasons why uh, you want to be, to be sure to cook um, any meat that is um, known for having parasites to cook it thoroughly. And so here we can see a video on the left of the nematode moving. Um, so uh, like, unlike the earthworms, they only have one type of muscle that's running from their head to their tail. And so it causes a different motion um, for movement. More of an up and down wave like motion as opposed to the inching forward motion. The lovely nematode. Moving right along to the second um, group in, in the uh, ectisocins are the arthropods. Um, so two out of every three known species of animals are arthropods. And they are united based on a few things that they have a segmented body a hard exoskeleton and jointed appendages. Uh, so these three things are usually found in all, all arthropods. And so that's um, something that's uh, good to know um, that they have those three things. And so you might ask, so what is a segmented body? Um, a segmented body is going to be one that has different features on different parts or different areas of the body. And so you can see um, in the next pictures, we'll point out uh, some different segments. A hard exoskeleton is going to be made out of um, protein and chitin, which is a polysaccharide um, similar to cellulose or starch, but its um, bonds of uh, the sugars are different. Uh, their, their arrangement's different. 
Um, and so that's a unique polysaccharide found in the exoskeleton. Um, and then jointed appendages, the appendages will have a joint, um, so uh, the connections between different parts of their legs, it will make it better for walking and for moving. And so uh, while this stuff here is great, um, it's really just extra information. Uh, and more about the appendages though, uh, we'll see there's some are modified for their functions like walking, feeding, sensory reception, reproduction, and defense. They also are um, going to be found in pairs. So that's another trend we'll see in this group. Uh, so looking at example here, we have our lovely uh, lobster. And so looking at the lobster, you can see a, a head. Um, there are three main regions. There's the head, um, the thorax, and the abdomen. And so all together, um, those are you know, three different segments. Uh, you could combine the head and the thorax region to be called the cephalothorax, if you're referring to the whole region of both the head and the thorax. And so the abdomen, you can tell uh, the appendages there are much different. They're much smaller, made for swimming, like a tail and smaller, um, what we call swimmer ets. Uh, they, they are special small little legs that help with movement when swimming. I believe that's how you spell it. And that's an R. There we go. Um, and so here, looking at your other things, you can see they have specialized um, appendages for defense, the pinchers, specialized feeding mouth parts, um, different sensory receptors of antennae, and then many walking legs that come in pairs, one on each side. So those are some uh, unifying features of arthropods. And so here we have a video of the mouth parts of the lobster. They are um, pretty well defined and well studied, but for us we'll just look at the overall um, functioning here. a lot of moving parts to have one function complete. So a lot of appendages just for feeding. In terms of arthropod um, exoskeleton, it is covered by a um, cuticle. Um, so the cuticle is the exoskeleton with uh, both the protein and the polysaccharide triton together. Um, and so as it, an arthropod grows, it'll eventually reach the maximum size uh, with that exoskeleton and so it's going to have to shed or molt that skeleton to get bigger and so um, you'll see arthropods once it's shed um, it's going to have to rebuild its exoskeleton and so um, after immediate, immediately after the molting process has been completed that arthropods can be very susceptible to um, predation and so it's very vulnerable during that time as it's trying to now build a much bigger exoskeleton. Um, other things they have eyes. Eyes uh, depending on the species it can be a simple eye or a compound eye. Uh, it can olfactory receptors they usually have very good sense of um, smell and touch with their antennae. Uh, most arthropods have an open circulatory system uh, where the heart pumps the blood to a vessel which then pumps to a region called um, 
and, uh, a hemolymph region where that blood is going to circulate with other fluid around um, tissues and organs, and then that will cycle back to another vessel that will return it to the um, heart to pump again. And so one thing that is different about this group is that their um, respiratory system, gas exchange is going to be separate from their circulatory system. So the circulatory system is spreading nutrients and gathering um, some particle waste, whereas the gas exchange um, system is usually through what we call a tracheal system, and that will be um, through uh, openings um, along the sides of their body. So it's much different um, than the uh, gas exchange and um, other organisms. And so this is, there's actually a variety of different organs, um, and that's just one of them, but we'll focus on just some general key features here, general um, ideas or different uh, general structures of all arthropods, <laughs> right? And so in this group, there's actually a few subdivisions. The first one is called chalicerate. Uh, the chalicerates are going to be made up of many different things. Um, some are spiders, horseshoe crabs, scorpions, um, ticks, and mites. We'll look at the next group um, after that, though, the myriapods or centipedes and millipedes, and then the pancrustaceans are going to be crustaceans and insects. And so these three groups are things you want to know. And so we'll go through each one of these groups um, and look at them just a bit more. Uh, so let's take a look at the cholesterates here. Uh, so they are known for their feeding appendages called cholesterate. Uh, which take different forms depending on the species. They can have more of a feeding claw-like appendage or more like a fang-like appendage. Um, but that is usually one of the appendages that they all have and several appendages. And so for the clisterates here, uh, let's take a look at the horseshoe crab is a, um, a very old um, and unchanging species that's thought to be a living fossil. Um, as you can see there, they are not a very um, a beautiful uh, closer to look at, but you can tell um, they do have those features of uh, the uh, clusterates. Looking at other ones in the clusterate group, most of them will be, uh, that are surviving will be arachnids. Uh, so arachnids are a group uh, that are unified by a few features, um, one of which being uh, six pairs of legs. And so that's something I think we'll see in the next slide here. Um, so in this arachnid group, we have the spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites that are shown here. Um, and so that's us here, arachnids. This is something I believe should be on here. Yes. Um, so for clusterates, the main idea is actually for, um, their subdivision of arachnids that they have six pairs of appendages. The first pair is a clusterate, which are examples down here. Um, and then the next pair, the second pair is called the pedipalps. Uh, this is usually used for feeding. And then they have four pairs of walking legs, so total number of eight legs. Um, and so those are shown there as well. Um, for spiders, their gas exchange uh, happens in unique respiratory organs called book lungs, um, which are also shown there next and highlighted um, in red next to the heart. Uh, many spiders will make silk to make uh, webs out of. They can use their webs to um, trap their uh, prey. They can use it um, to then wrap up their prey into a gift to bestow onto their uh, mate. Uh, 
Uh, there's many different reasons. Uh, they can also use it um, as a balloon-like structure to um, uh, float through the air. There are many different uses of their uh, silk um, for, uh, for in their environment. Okay, moving right along to the myriapods. Uh, so the myriapods is the second group of the arthropods, and they're made up of millipedes and centipedes. Uh, so millipedes are going to be herbivores uh, that they'll eat decaying leaves and plant matter, and they have very many legs per segment or um, on their body in uh, several pairs, so two pairs of legs per segment. Whereas centipedes are uh, carnivores, they're going to eat smaller insects, uh, uh, smaller than themselves, and they're going to have uh, less legs, one pair of legs uh, per trunk segment. And so those are the big differences that we'll want to know for these two, the centipedes and the millipedes. Uh, so millipedes, they have in this image, can tell they have more legs per segment and they're feeding on plant matter, whereas the centipedes can have less legs and it's going to be carnivorous and look for a smaller insects to eat. And so this is, this summarizes it all pretty well. So I would say this one here, um, the study. And so that moves us right along to the last group of arthropods, the pancrustaceans. And so they're made up of both the insects and the crustaceans. So it's a very, very large group um, as there are several, several um, subgroups of insects. And so looking at the crustaceans here, they're made up of lobsters, crayfish, or if you're um, from the South like me, crawfish, uh, barnacles, crab, and shrimp. And so they're known for having highly specialized appendages um, that as you can see here, they have the uh, very thick pincher um, appendages, uh, a lot of feeding appendages usually as we saw in the lobster, um, and uh, they'll have different um, appendages for sensory reception. So the antenna also um, for touch reception are, um, can also be considered highly specialized appendages. Let's see. And so looking at uh, some more examples here, uh, they can differ based on their uh, amount of pairs of legs. Uh, so they call here uh, isopods and decapods um, are divided based on uh, several different features and that the isopods are in many different environments. A pill bug is an example of isopod, whereas decapods are going to have um, be very large crustaceans, um, include uh, the larger ones we're familiar with, like lobsters, crabs, shrimp. But there are uh, very small crustaceans, like even smaller than isopods, the planktonic crustaceans are going to have um, many species of what we call copepods, and those are the most numerous of all animals, and that um, they can be uh, fed on by much larger species of animals. And so they're in, in larger numbers to try to combat the um, being preyed upon by a large animal. And so in the uh, picture on the left, uh, that is a barnacle. Um, barnacle is, uh, was once thought to be a mollusk due to its shell that you see on the outer surface, but it's actually a crustacean due to its specialized appendages and um, tentacle-like pro projections you see there. And then the shrimp-like krill is what you see on the second um, picture, and that is eaten um, in large amounts by a whale. So looking at insects now. Uh, so this is still part of the arth arthropod group. Uh, the arthropods will is a very, very large group. 
And so insects live pretty much everywhere um, that can be found in freshwater and terrestrial habitats. Uh, they will have many, many different body plans. But one thing um, that's found in most insects is the ability to fly. Uh, so that these animals are, you know, small in nature can fly and escape predators, find new sources of food, and disperse to new habitats. Um, contributes to its large success. And so um, the wings themselves are usually an extension of the protective covering, the cuticle, um, for uh, insects. And so you can see some overall um, structures in this grasshopper that they have uh, three regions, the head, the thorax, the abdomen. Uh, that, so these three regions are found generally in all insects. They have three pairs of walking legs, and then they normally have, or most of them will have wings. And so those are the unifying features of all insects. Um, it's not a whole lot, but it's... Um, it's a, enough to give some good classification here to insects. And so if you were to look at insects in terms of their functioning, you can see in this grasshopper, they have a complete digestive system. Um, they'll have an a usually an open circulatory system to bathe in the hemolymph, they'll bathe in the uh, liquid in the, around the organs. Uh, they have a, a good uh, nervous system with a, a cerebral ganglion cluster of nerves for a brain. Uh, their respiratory system is going to be actually a tracheal system. Uh, so when we hit the uh, circulatory system chapter, uh, we'll, I think we actually take a brief look at their unique tracheal system. That's completely separated from their circulatory system. And so one, the tracheal system is used to gas, for gas exchange, whereas the circulatory system is used to spread the nutrients around. So they're separate there. Um, but for insects, we'll focus on metamorphosis. Uh, so I believe we saw earlier in another chapter, metamorphosis is when the uh, youth or the um, larva changes into the adult. And so for incomplete metamorphosis, the, um, the uh, nymphs, which is their word for um, the larva, is going to res resemble the adult, but they're smaller. And so they go through a series of molts of uh, shedding their um, exoskeleton um, until they reach the full size of the adult. And, and at some point, they complete their reproductive development as well. Whereas insects with a complete metamorphosis will have uh, separate stages. Um, so they'll have the larva stage, um, and then they'll have what we call it pupa stage, um, or is essentially a juvenile stage, and then uh, the adult stage. And so we can see that in this next image here. Um, the complete metamorphosis from the larva. Um, so at this point, uh, the larva is morphologically different than the adult and it's sexually immature. Um, and so then it goes into a pupa um, form, like an outer covering form in these stages. And then it will merge as an adult. Um, and so uh, it's, there's not a true juvenile stage where it looks like the adult, but it's sexually immature. But um, And so we give it the, state, the name pupa here. Um, but the adult now is fully um, grown and sex, sex, sexually mature. Um, and so let's take a look at this video of the butterfly emerging from the pupa.
And so all of this is um, great information. You can tell how big insects classification really is and that they have 30 different orders. Um, but that's not something we'll focus on. So here, so I make sure we highlight key ideas there. Um, and that this uh, shows you all the different organization, but it's not something that we'll want to really focus on. And so that moves us to the next group. Uh, so that wraps up arthropods and insects. And so now we'll move to the echinoderms, which will lead us to the uh, chordates, which is the group with the backbone. And so the echinoderms include sea stars and sea urchins, also sand dollars. And so let's take a look at that group here. Uh, so they are usually so, slow moving or sessile uh, marine animals with a uh, ex, er, sorry, endoskeleton. Uh, so they have a nice thin skin layer and then the rough endoskeleton right underneath it. And this is formed from hard calcareous or calcium containing plates. And so they have um, this very tough protection from the endoskeleton, but it's not on the outer surface as like the insects. And so looking at your echinoderms, the way they um, move is through a unique process of, called the water vascular system. Um, and so this is a network of canals that transports water um, to structures called the tube feet. And so tube feet are very, very important for the sea stars and other echinoderms in that it helps them with moving, um, so locomotion, feeding, uh, grasping um, prey like clams, and will also help with um, other things like uh, staying in place like suction um, to one area. And so here we can take a look at this video um, that will show us those tube feet and other structures. Uh, so the madriporic plate is the beginning of the water vascular system. And so it's zooming up on that plate for you there. And so water goes in through that plate and then eventually will go all the way down to the tube feet where then it, that um, water, the presence of the water, or the absence of the water allows for the movement of the tube feet. And so that's why the water vascular system is so important to these um, echinoderms. And so let's take a little bit more of a look at the echinoderms here and the sea star in particular. Uh, you can see it has uh, spines on the outer surface for protection as, as well as gills for gas exchange. Um, the madriporite plate that you uh, can see here is the beginning of the water vascular system that brings water in um, and it goes from that to what we call um, a, a canal connecting it to the center uh, so it goes to the stone canal and then from there it goes to a ring canal which is pointed out then to the radial canal to all the um, little arms or rays is what they i think they're supposed to call them are rays um, each arm is a ray and then finally to the tube feet. And so that's a very central part of the echinoderms. And so that's one that you'll want to know are the importance of the water vascular system. Um, and so here, let me move this back so you can look at the words. Um, so that's definitely one you want to know. 
along with, you can tell in the orientation of the C star in particular that they are radially symmetrical. Um, I'm just going to abbreviate here, symmetrical. And so they actually have a larva stage, you know, so it's morphologically different than the adult that is a bilateral symmetrical um, orientation, which is not pictured, unfortunately. I don't have that here, um, but that is another uh, thing that you'll want to understand is it, uh, that this is really symmetrical and that its larva is the opposite of that and is bilaterally symmetrical. <clears throat> oh, so that's also in here. Um, and so they have five clades. Uh, these clades, while they are important, are not something I ask you to memorize, so don't worry about that. And so looking at sea stars, um, you'll probably already know that they can regrow their lost arms. Um, and so the um, ability to do so is uh, done by uh, asexual production, reproduction. Um, but uh, for it to survive, it will need at least um, one ray and a part of this central disc right here. And so that um, is why uh, when fisher, fishermen were collecting clams on the coast um, and trying to get rid of sea stars that would eat the clams, uh, they would tear the sea stars in half thinking that they're killing them when effectively they're uh, re making them grow more in number. And so a sea star would take about anywhere from a few months to about a year to regenerate lost appendages, um, which is a unique trait of sea stars. Uh, let's see, what else here? Oh, they're feeding. Uh, so sea stars will feed on different bivalves. Um, bivalves that we saw earlier in this chapter, so clams, mussels, scallops, uh, maybe pretty much anything with two shells or two halves of a shell. Um, and so they'll use their tube feet to bright, pry them open with um, and pulling them apart. And so then after that, they're going to open up their mouth, uh, spit their stomach out, um, and that stomach contains digestive enzymes that are going to digest that prey externally and then they'll suck it all in to uh, through their mouth um, and so from there that digestive food will go to several other stomachs um, one inside the center here um, and then from there it's going to go out uh, to the rest of each ray through these digestive glands that you see here and then eventually the re the waste will go out through the top of um, the anus there. Let's see. Um, so he here is the one of the first of several different groups: the sea stars, the sea daisies. Uh, sea daisies are shown here. They're armless species. The brittle stars are have very unique appen um, physical appearance and that their rays are very, very thin as opposed to the thick rays that we just saw. Uh, the next group are the sea urchins and the sand dollars. They um, don't have arms but have rows of tube feet. And sea lilies and feather stars have a very unique, um, long, flexible arm appearance there. And you have sea cucumbers in this group as well. They lack spines, have a very reduced exoskeleton, but uh, do have five rows of two feet. And so that brings us to uh, phylum chordata, the... Um, that will now uh, eventually become the ver vertebrate group. And so that 
kind of wraps up this section here on this chapter. So the next slides here kind of take you through each phylum with their main, uh, with their description here. And so these are great to help you review on each group, um, but stick, do stick to what you see on the uh, review for this chapter. Um, since the next chapter we go over core dates, this last portion here, uh, you don't really need to worry about as we'll look at that next chapter. So um, please let me know if you have any questions, but for uh, now that's the it. That's it of this chapter. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.